Welcome back to this chapter of the Business Library. Today I have Alison Van Halen on. She is a content SEO expert. She actually makes sure as people's content gets views, which is quite important because there's plenty of good content out there and you might make some, but it doesn't get any views. <laughs> then this makes the, a lot of sense for you to, to take a look at. This episode is also sponsored by our new course. The link is down in the description. If you're a beginner at content marketing, Alison links is also down there. So if you hear something you like, check them out. Why not? Made it as easy for you as possible. I intentionally made the intro a little bit brief about how you started doing content marketing mm -hmm. because I read the story on LinkedIn and it's so good. I want you to tell it because I'm going to miss something. So <laughs> where did your journey start when it comes to content marketing? Yeah, um, well, I and I do usually start with that story when I'm doing things like this. So thank you for <laughs> for that. Um, yeah, it is an interesting story. It started, I mean, really way back when I was a kid and first learned my alphabet and was writing stories ever. Every chance I got um, was told growing up that writers don't make any money and I should choose a more practical career. <laughs> so I figured if I couldn't make a living writing books, maybe I could make a living making books. So the plan was to go into publishing. So I went to college, ended up majoring in English and psychology, which turned out to be the perfect degree for content marketing. Had no clue what content marketing was. Like I said, thought I wanted to work in publishing. Graduated in 2009, right after the job market crashed. So that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> so I ended up answering phones for a few years, found myself between jobs at one point, And my roommate at the time, her dad, who was an attorney, was awesome and offered to give me stuff to do around his office until I got back on my feet. And one of the things he needed was someone to write blog posts for his law firm. And he knew I had a strong writing background. So he offered me the gig. And I was like, what? I can get paid to write? Seriously? Yeah, sign me up. So I jumped at that chance and started writing for him and then for an associate of his and then for some friends of mine. And it just kept growing from there. I did eventually get another day job, but I kept writing on the side. And it was one of those where anytime anyone asked what I was doing, what I did for a living, I'd be like, well, I answer phones, but I'm really a writer. And I would put much more emphasis on the writing than the day job I did not like. So once the writing grew to a point where I could ditch the day job, take the writing gig full time, which was... I want to say 2015, 2016-ish, um, that, that's what I did. <laughs> Jumped in with, with both feet and said bye-bye to the day job and never looked back. Uh, yep, I, that's a, a relatable goal. And I think a lot of people listening can also relate to that goal because you need money in to actually run a business. So mm -hmm. Even though if you don't have any clients, it's, it still costs a little bit of, bit of money to run. To yep. some extent, you're going to find some expense. Yep. Uh, but yeah, I, I was, I was also very surprised when you mentioned law firms because it was so niche mm -hmm. at our first conversation. But it, what you say was meant to be, maybe. I know. <laughs> it really feels like it. It really feels the universe was like, you no, go over here. <laughs> you're supposed to be doing this thing. <laughs> mm. So. I imagine it being like a difficult sometimes because there's a lot of like laws and all that stuff around it. So how do you make sure to still go in and do what's necessary to make good SEO? Yeah. So that was interesting because I think if you had told me when I started out that I would need to learn SEO in order to continue doing this professionally, I would have been too intimidated to even try. I would have been mm. like, oh, no, thank you. I'll just go back to my safe, secure job that I hate, but at least I know what I'm doing. Um, I actually kind of stumbled into SEO. Um, it started when a friend of mine um, sent me a screenshot of some keywords research he had done for me just for fun, I guess. Um, and that was it. I was hooked. I was like, wait, people are searching for this word more than this word, even though they mean basically the same thing. And that was it. I was down the SEO rabbit hole and never really found my way back out. So I am now following the blogs and reading the books and watching the YouTube videos and following all the influencers um, to keep including Google, uh, reading their blog regularly to see what's what's up, what's new, what's old, what's claiming to be new, but is really old, um, all that good stuff. So yeah, I found, I actually found that it's fascinating. 
And I'm so glad that I ended up stumbling into SEO just because it has gotten so much more competitive back when I started for that one law firm. It was, yeah, all you needed to do was write good content on a regular basis and you were good to go. Um, it's gotten so much more competitive. It takes a lot more than that now to have an effective blog. So you really need to do your keyword research, make sure you know what to do with those keywords, follow all of Google's rules so that they can help you show up when people are looking for you. Yeah. Well, I, I actually, I didn't know that Google had a blog regarding mm -hmm. that. I imagine that's quite a good source because, well, who better to actually listen to than the Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you're always no. going to get competing information. And I think even from Google, sometimes you get, so I always take what Google says with a grain of salt. Um, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for it's... the most part, it's it's a really good source of information. There's some things, and this comes up to the, all platforms and informational sources that's free. There's mm -hmm. certain things they keep from, from you. Mm -hmm. They're not going to tell you the whole ditch and, and give the whole business away so you can go out and copy it. Exactly. So with, you mentioned a little bit how much SEO has changed since you started doing it. Mm -hmm. Today, in 2024, what do you see as some of the crucial elements that makes up a good piece of content when it comes to the SEO part? Yeah, um, keywords are still important. Um, I think... Back when I started, you could just stuff your keyword as many times. You could pick one keyword and stuff it in there as many times as you could possibly keyword into the keyword with the keyword, <laughs> and it would actually work. Um, and is Google has since wised up and is now like, yeah, no, we're not. That's not good content. We're not putting people to, pointing people towards that content. So now that can actually hurt your SEO. So don't don't keyword stuff your content. Um, one thing that has changed that's really cool is Google has gotten better at identifying synonyms. So yes, have your target keyword, have your related keywords, but instead of having a few keywords that you use over and over again, come up with synonyms and use those throughout the content. A, it's going to be better content. People are actually going to want to read that. And Google will still pick up on that and have a better idea of what your content is all about. Google is also getting better and better just in general at identifying high quality content because um, it doesn't want to point people towards crappy content because that makes them look bad. They don't want to point people towards, you know, content that's thin and has a, you know, one word repeated over and over. So they're getting better and better at identifying what is actually good content and pointing people to that content. I actually didn't know they picked up on synonyms. So I'll let mm -hmm. something new today as well. Yeah, that's fairly recent. And, and then, at least from my knowledge, it's becoming more and more the norm across all platforms. It's mm -hmm. make it for humans because whatever systems that they use nowadays, they're so good that they know what humans like. And that's what mm -hmm. they're actually going towards. Yeah, and that's really Back good. When goal is yeah, to ahead. point people towards the content that that they want to read that they want to see that answers their questions so yeah write for the humans first and foremost because a your content has to convert the people once they get to your website but secondly google is also getting better and better like google's whole goal is to identify quality content that answers people's questions and point people towards it so if if you create content that does that google will eventually figure it out and reward you for it <laughs> Yeah, it, well, it's I never tried the back in the days um, with websites where you could put like AAA in front to get a top and all of that. Good easy. Stuff. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's that was not very, even for my time. Be fun. Yeah. A a a a a a. Yeah, well, yeah, that came from the phone changed. book because when you open the phone book, the AAA was right at at the beginning. So that's um, yeah, that's where that came from. I imagine by having to find something in a phone book right? being very frustrating <laughs> compared to Google, like very, very frustrating. Yeah. So like what's a good place to find a good keyword? Um, so there are a bunch of tools out there. My favorite tool is serpstat, S E R P S T A T dot com. Um, it's a pretty, a comprehensive SEO tool, actually. Um, but that's that's the keyword uh, tool that I use to research all of my keywords. 
Um, I always start, people always want to know where to start. Like, okay, what keywords am I, am I researching? Um, I start first and foremost with your products and services and the questions people are asking. If you are on calls like this, if you are at networking events, if you're at cocktail parties and someone asks what you do and you get the same questions over and over and over again, if people are asking you those questions in person and on Zoom and over the phone, they're also probably asking them of Google. So create content that answers those questions. So start there. But also start with, you know, your your products, your services, your company name, your whatever, your industry. Start with those and see what comes up when you search it and then narrow it down from there. Um, you might even find that your industry is a pretty good keyword. Content marketing, when I started, was a good keyword, and now it's way more competitive than it used to be. Um, so depending on what industry you're in, it might be, it might you might get results just by using the name of your industry. Um, so start there. Um, the other tool I love to use is called Answer the Public, where you can put in a just one word or a, a few words as a search term. Um, and it will generate for you all of the questions asked across the internet. And you can actually specify, excuse me, you can specify whether it's um, from Google or from Bing or from Yahoo. So you can say like what people are looking for this information or what questions are they asking using this search term in this from this search engine or in this search engine. So you can tailor it that way. If you think that your audience isn't really using Google, maybe they are using Bing or Yahoo for whatever reason. So um, that's really cool because it gives you a ton of questions that people are asking using that word um, or phrase. But then I always take, you know, I look for good questions I can answer and then I take it back to my keyword research tool and make sure it's actually a good keyword. So it's not just like one or two people looking for it. Are there a significant number of people looking for this information? And is there a content gap? Is that something that has not already been covered to death by everyone else? Yeah, that's uh, at least in the start what I forgot to look at because mm -hmm. it's very similar when you do like YouTube keyword optimization, very similar thing within the content and forgot to look at the competition. It's like, these are big words a lot of people are using them, but every big influencer that has a million above followers are also hitting these keywords. So mm -hmm. good luck trying to rank and compete with these guys. <laughs> well, it's getting easier with how things have opened up with, with algorithms, but still, mm -hmm. there's a reason why people are at the level that's because they make brilliant content or did at one point. Mm -hmm. uh, in regards to like, is how much difference is there between like keywords on Bing, Yahoo, Google? Is it just people that use like different vocabularies? Um, that's a good question, and I don't actually know the answer to that. I would recommend people playing around on Answer the Public and seeing if they get different answers. Um, because yeah, as an SEO professional, I often joke that when technically there are a lot more search engines than Google but Google owns like 90 some percent of the search market. Um, so essentially when we say SEO, we're really talking about Google, um, not to mention the amount of searches that people perform on YouTube because they want to see a video of something or how to do something on YouTube. Um, Google owns YouTube. So that, yeah. that works into that their algorithm as well. So don't forget about that. So yeah, Google is is the giant. Although now that they're facing an antitrust lawsuit, <laughs> we'll see <laughs> how that well, develops. I think, they've, I think they've had a couple of those over here. It's just a couple. Yeah, of, they're like, probably because you five. guys, you guys are more on top of that than we are. We've gotten really <laughs> lazy about our monopolies over here in the U.S. Yeah, but like once you look at the numbers, actually, it's like a slap on the wrist, and they're like, "Yeah, I know." They don't back even in care. a month. <laughs> what do you guys think? <laughs> yeah, it's very much. It's like a, a month of profit. So it's kind yeah. of easy. <laughs> yeah, they're like, "Okay, here's yeah, <laughs> You you pointed out um, when it comes to SEO and, and YouTube videos. It's funny you say that because I used to make videos about shoes, and the most popular video I did on that channel, I think it's a little over ten. Okay, um, I can't quite remember, but primarily, I think it's like 67% of this views on that video of that 11,000 views comes from Google, oh. not YouTube, because so it's think about Google and 
when you do YouTube mm -hmm. videos as well. I probably should have said that in the start. Um, yeah, work your keywords into now. your YouTube video title and description and all that good stuff because that will affect your SEO of of your videos. Yeah. So when it comes to like, do you when it comes to the content, do you find the keywords? then make the content from the keywords or have the opposite approach of making the content and then linking in keyboard stuff that works. Yeah, I start with the keyword because that tells me what people, what questions people are asking across the internet related to that topic. So if I start answering a question that no one's interested in or that everyone else has already answered, then that doesn't do me a whole lot of good. So the topic is going to be centered around a particular keyword. Um, and what questions people are asking around that keyword. So that's my target keyword. So I start with that. That's kind of my guiding star for that piece of content is what is this question people are asking? How can I answer it? How can I help them with this problem, with this question, whatever it might be? So always, always start with that keyword. You might want to afterwards fill in some, um, some of those related keywords so like I said, you don't want just one, you have a target keyword, that's your main keyword that you're targeting for that piece of content, but you also want your related keywords sprinkled throughout your content so that Google still under, Google gets a more comprehensive understanding of what this content is all about. And it demonstrates that you are providing comprehensive content around this topic. You're not just answering one facet of this question. You've got this major question and then you've got smaller questions related to it that you are also answering. So that's gonna be longer, more in-depth content. Google likes the longer, more in-depth content. We can argue all day about whether or not that actually makes for good content. But like I said, Google owns search basically online. So if, if we wanna show up in front of people when they're looking for us, we have to play by Google's rules. Um, with you saying that, what would you say is is the best length for a post or a piece of content to show up in Google search and rank? Mm -hmm. There is no one answer to that. Um, the minimum is like 500 words because that's what Google arbitrarily decided a while back. So definitely no less than 500 words. Um, I've heard some people say they never do less than like 2,000 or 3,000 per post, which is kind of insane. Um, I, I don't see the need to do that. Yes, you should have the occasional like really in-depth, really long blog post that is 2,000 or even 3,000 words long, but not every post has to be that way. If you have a keyword that you're you're targeting and it's actually a fairly quick answer and you can cover it in 700, 800 words and you're done, then you're done. That's fine. Don't fill it with fluff to reach an arbitrary word count because again, Google eventually will catch on to the fact that that is thin content and it will punish you for that. So don't do that. Um, look for the keyword, do some keyword research and see if there are any other pieces of content. Like I said, it can be a piece of con or a keyword that has some content using that keyword. You just don't want a keyword that has a ton of content. So look at the few pieces that are already using that keyword. How long are they? If they're super long, then yeah, you're going to want your content to be really long as well. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to compete. But if they're all shorter pieces, then you can have a shorter piece. Um, my guiding star for that is always answer the question as in depth as you possibly can. Google loves those ultimate guide style posts. And honestly, people do too. I know I hear a lot of people saying, oh, my people don't read that much. First of all, yes, they do. The data shows that the longer the piece of content is, the more time people spend engaging with it. So yeah, if they're really interested in the content, they will spend several minutes reading it. Second, if you have a super long piece of content and you cover everything there is to cover on a given topic, they might not read the whole thing, but if you make it skimmable, if you make it easy for them to jump to certain sections that answer their specific questions, maybe they already have a general idea of this topic, but they have a specific question about it. If you have covered everything there is to cover on this topic, they're going to find an answer to that question, um, which makes your content more valuable for them as well as for everyone who finds your content. And again, Google will catch on to that. So my, again, start with 500 words. No less than that, but beyond that, once you've answered that question as in depth as you possibly can, you're done. Don't worry about the word count. Mm. Yeah, I've heard. I can't remember who said it, 
but a person said there's no such thing as content that's too long there's only content that's too boring <laughs> yes I, I haven't heard that but i love that <laughs> yeah uh, I, well, I wish I could credit it because I, I'm not going to take the credit for it. I definitely heard somebody else say that before. Uh, I just can't remember the name of it. But it's very true because I've referred to movies sometimes. Like you can get people and watch a two mm -hmm. and a half hour movie mm -hmm. um, or read a book all day if it's good enough. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if your content is as engaging as a movie or a book, people will keep on consuming it. Um, mm -hmm. until there is no more of it and they might even back you for more mm -hmm. yeah so how do you make sure you make your content good so people actually want to read it yeah um so that requires just answering their questions putting it into a story storytelling is my favorite because again this is how i got started and what i do is by telling a good story um, and that's really what I did for my very first client, that law firm I was writing for. He was writing, um, prior to me taking over, he was writing his own blog posts, which is a terrible idea because lawyers should not be allowed to do their own marketing. Um, he, you know, started off pretty strong. I was reading some of his blog posts to get an idea of like, okay, I've never actually written a blog post before. What am I doing? And so I would read his blog post and, you know, the first paragraph or two was pretty strong. And then in the third paragraph, it jumped to something completely unrelated. And I was like, what the, how did you get from there to there? And I sat there and I figured it out because I was getting paid to, but it's important to remember that if I had been a prospect, I would have said, okay, thanks. I'm going to get what I need somewhere else because this is not helping me. Um, like I said, I sat there and figured it out because I was getting paid to. I did eventually figure out, okay, this is what he was trying to do. Okay, got it. But they were very boring <laughs> and very convoluted and jumped around a lot um, and didn't really answer people's questions. Or they did, but you kind of had to dig for it. Don't make people, do not make people work for it because we have very short attention spans and there's a ton of other things we could be doing and a ton of other pieces of content we could be reading. You, you have to earn our attention. So, First and foremost, tell them a story. So what I did uh, when I was writing for them, which again, this is the strategy that worked back in the day that has you know mixed success now, um, is I would take a case from the news that was similar to the kinds of cases they worked on. And I would basically tell that case, tell them about that case in, in a story. You know, here's the problem. Here's how it got worse. <laughs> here's why it got worse. Here's how we could have helped if they had asked us ahead of time. If you need this help, call us, right? So there's the problem, there's the agitation, there's the solution, and then there's the outcome. So it's P-A-S-O or PESO, right? Is problem, agitation, solution. What's the problem? Why are people here in the first place? What happens if they don't solve that problem? What's the solution that you're providing? And then really important, what's that outcome? What does that look like? So I always like to frame this in um, what I call the Cinderella formula, right? So you've got Cinderella, she's in the castle, her father just died, right? And then it make, it gets even worse. <laughs> she, her evil stepmother and stepsisters are awful to her and they make her work as a scullery maid and they don't let her go anywhere. Awful. Uh, solution, fairy godmother. That's you. Remember that you have to come in as the fairy godmother with the solution, with the dress. The outcome is she is at the ball, dancing with the prince. Life is as good as it ever has been for her and probably ever will be, right? That is the pinnacle. So paint that picture for your audience. What does lo working with you look like once you have solved that problem for them? What is their version of dancing at the ball with the prince, with the gorgeous dress and the glass slippers and all of the things, right? Paint that picture for them, but then go back to the problem. Remind them that, you know, Cinderella's back in the castle, pumpkin or carriage is back to being a pumpkin, horses are back to being mice, dress is back to rags, and she's back to her old life. Um, and then you're going to leave your, your prospect there. You're not going to give them the happy ending because you have to remind them that they have to reach out to you to get that happy ending. Um, so that, that is my formula. There are a bunch of formulas. There are other ways that you can incorporate storytelling into your content, but that is, that is my favorite way to do it. Yeah. I think when it, it comes to storytelling, I love that you gave the, the Cinderella example because the best stories are movies or books or, or 
because it's just supposed to be a story. And but you can interact the exact same thing into your content of, mm -hmm. of how you take people through that emotional journey if you really dive deep into it. And I would encourage yeah, people I used listening to, to Yeah, I use the ahead. Cinderella example because everyone knows about that story. But also if you pay attention, like ninety percent of the movies that come out of Hollywood use that that same formula. You'll see the ups and the downs and the ups again. So there's there's a reason they use it all the time because it works. Yeah, it's it's a proven formula, and there ain't no reason to change it too much because it it's not broken. It works very very well. Um, yep. I was watching um, a YouTube video from a, a group of guys in the UK that's very big um, Sunday, and one of the things that they talked about because they got like a challenge and was to write a blog, and their response was like a blog. Wait, what? <laughs> um, playing on the typical joke blogging is dead uh -huh. what is your response when person people say blogging is dead or make the inclination yeah well you just heard me laugh at that so yeah. <laughs> that's my initial reaction um it is something you i hear that. a lot um i think i mean on the one hand it goes back to the idea that people don't read which as i have a giant collection of books behind me and that's just a small <laughs> small part of my collection. Yes, people do still read. Um, not to mention the fact that Google is struggling with audio and visual content with categorizing, indexing and figuring out what that content is all about. It's working on it. It's still struggling. Google still relies primarily on text. So yes, you do need text based content for an SEO perspective. And yes, people are going to read it. Um, that's not to say that video is not a big thing or podcasts are not a big thing. Obviously they are. That's why I'm here doing this. So yes, use your video, use your podcasts, but also use that text. Don't discount the text because yes, there are going to be people who are want, going to want to listen to the podcast or watch the video. There are also going to be people who may have a hard time listening to or watching the video if they um, have hearing problems. Maybe they want to read the content. Maybe they can only read the content. That's the only way they can they can access it. Um, and then there are people like me who are like, yeah, I could spend all my time listening to this or watching this, but I can absorb it much more quickly if I'm just scanning the the text. So yeah, all kinds of reasons that that blogging is still alive and well. Yes, you should be podcasting and doing videos, but don't neglect your blog. It comes down to communicating on as many different channels as possible mm -hmm. because you ain't gonna catch me reading a long blog because i don't particularly enjoy it so this is actually a very good example of you and me here because mm -hmm. you would probably prefer that you would you prefer let's say if we turn this podcast into a, a blog post to read that compared to listening to it or watching it Yes, absolutely. And that is one thing that I always recommend in terms of repurposing your content is you can create a video like this and then take the audio and turn it into a podcast and then take this transcript from the audio, clean it up a little bit and turn that into your blog post. There's no reason to create three separate pieces of content when you can do it once and then just break it up. And then, yeah, like you said, have different pieces of content that are different forms of content that are providing the same message and answering the same question. And it's just a great way to get it out in as many different places as you can. That gives you so many more opportunities to get in front of people. And then you can link to all of those different pieces of content from all the other pieces of content. And that's a uh, great backlink juice, which is also great for your SEO. So see countless uh, ways, actually, reasons to do it. That's actually a thing we, we didn't cover and we, we don't really have time to, I would say, because I know it's a bigger subject. So if you want to learn about it, reach out to Alison. Uh, don't reach out to me. I'm not an expert <laughs> in that. Uh, because I wanted to make sure I got time to ask you this question as well. Um, as a past leader, um, this was of people in the age group of 16 to 22. Um, I saw that you work with teen girls as a writing mentor. And I wanted to ask, well, what is some of the things you picked up from, from working with kids? 
I always like that psychology. Yeah, um, so. I'm so glad you picked up on that and that you asked me about this. No one asks me about this. It's the the magazine is called This Girl's Story. It is a mag. It's a digital magazine, so you can access it from anywhere. You can contribute to it from anywhere if you are a teen who identifies as a girl. Um, it is something someone uh, in a networking group that I'm part of. We met online, and she said she was doing this. Um, and said that she was looking for volunteers to mentor. And I put my hand up Hermione style and said, me, 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 me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would have loved to have something like this when I was a teen. Um, and it's amazing because these, these girls, we have these meetings on Zoom once a week. So the girls are from all over the U.S. Um, and we meet on Zoom and I watch them put together this magazine talk about the pieces. We have a theme for each magazine. It comes out quarterly. So with each piece, it's, okay, does this fit the theme? Why or why not? Can we finagle it to get it to fit the theme? <laughs> Sometimes we stretch the theme a little bit to make stuff work. Um, and then how are we going to get a hold of people? How are we going to get them to contribute? And these girls are amazing. I mean, first of all, we get to watch them put together. And first they, they write blog posts because I am a mentor and I have been talking about blogging a lot. So um, they, they do write blog posts every week and I get to watch them write the blog posts and they edit them together. Um, and then I get to watch them write the, the letter to the editor that comes out with every issue. Um, and it's just so much fun. Um, really, I don't have to do much as a mentor. Obviously, I'm there if they have a question. But for the most part, I just love sitting back and watching these girls figure it out on their own and, and be smart and amazing. And I am so inspired and so hopeful um, knowing that the future is in the hands of these teen girls and hearing them say things like, yeah, okay, someone hasn't gotten back to me. I'll just keep bugging them until they get back to me. So we have content for this magazine. And I'm like, yes, that is such an awesome life skill that took me until, you know, a few years ago <laughs> to master. I'm still kind of working on, and these are teenagers and they're already building that. I, I love it so much. So yeah, this girl's story, check it out. Yeah, I love that kind of mentorship thing as well. Just as you talked about it, because it, that's what allows them to be in the position that I also wish I was in. Of yeah, just being a bit more persistent and don't care too much. What what are they gonna think if they don't get back to me? Well, if they're not gonna get back to me, it doesn't matter what they're gonna think. And then really, yeah taking that approach so so as soon as i saw it i was like I, I have to hear a little bit about this and i will i'll link to it down below if there's some sort of website or blog yes there is yeah out. i will send i will send you that link afterwards absolutely so yeah if, if people want to check it out definitely check it out down below is there something else you would like to leave our audience with or you believe they would get a benefit from being the next step after watching this installment yeah, if you have not done so already, I would say consistency is the key to really everything in business, but especially in marketing and SEO. Whether you have a blog, a vlog, a podcast, all of the above, make sure you have a schedule and you publish consistently because a people pay attention to that when they get to your website. But Google also pays attention to that too. Google prioritizes newer content over older content, which again is one of the reasons to have a blog on your website. I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, and also just the fact that if they don't see any new content for a while, they're going to start to wonder, is anyone still behind this website? Have they just abandoned this website? What's going on here? And again, the real life people who get to your website will wonder the same thing if they see that you haven't published anything since, you know, April of last year. Yep. That's, and you're actually right in saying that because the first time, first thing I look at when I go to a website, I see a blog is mm -hmm. how much are they posting to find out is this person even serious? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if you post if that's once how you year, treat your website and if that's how they treat their blog, is that what, what I can expect as a client? No. So, so to some extent, unless it's like really, really high quality content, you need to be there. I don't know what timing you would recommend. So I'm actually going to leave that specifically to you. You're the expert. Yeah, well, timing, like I said, as long as you're consistent, I don't think, I mean, yeah, there are certain recommendations as far as timing. It really depends on your audience. Um, definitely no less than once per month, preferably two to four times per month. 
if you can swing it. But again, consistency matters more than anything. So if you can only do one a month consistently without going crazy, then do that. Make it an awesome, awesome, really long in-depth blog post once a month. Yeah. And if, if you're good enough, actually, you get, at least on YouTube, I, I don't, don't know if it's the same one on Google exactly. If you're good enough, um, then as soon as I've seen some people, they'll only upload, I think it's like four times a year. Mm -hmm. But as soon as they upload, everybody's there. Everybody mm -hmm. wants to see it. Um, I don't know mm -hmm. if Google can pick up on that kind of stuff as well when it comes to this person knows how to do a good blog post. They just don't do it very often. Mm -hmm. Well, and again, that's part of building an audience. If you build an audience and you train them to understand this is when my blog post goes up, then yeah, they're going to show up at, at that time every week, every month, every whatever to, to get that new update from you. So yeah, absolutely. That's less of an SEO and more of a marketing strategy tip, but yeah, it holds up. I think we we focused enough on SEO. We can go a little bit. It's hard. I mean, to just they're so that. intertwined. Specific. You can't have one without the other. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, when if like when what is the best place to go out, connect with you, learn more about what you do? Of course. Yeah. The, well, the uh, I do have my own website. Know. AV as in my initials, Allison Verhalen. So that is avwritingservices.com. Um, I'm on LinkedIn quite a bit uh, as Allison Verhalen. I think I'm the only Allison Verhalen on there. Um, I am on YouTube as well as Allison Verhalen, so you can find me there. Um, and you can grab my book, Content Marketing Made Easy, that is uh, over on uh, Amazon. I'll have, as mentioned, all those links down below. Thank you very much for, for taking the time to come on today. I had a real pleasure speaking with you. Some some good stories and, and a unique spin on. In my eyes, a boring subject. Now we're nearly done. I can actually say it. Good. But you made it interesting <laughs> and fun. I actually Good. enjoyed I'm glad. quite a lot. <laughs>